Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Vladimir, for this opportunity to talk with you. And well, let me begin. First, let me share my computer, my presentation that I have some words to say. Really interesting here. A lot of things that I want to talk to you. And let's see, share screen. Perfect. Well, my presentation is called History of Fiat Money, its relation with fintech business, and of course, the global decentralized investment culture. And why is that? Well, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of days ago, I had the chance to participate in this marathon fintech Latin America, and we talked several things. Of course, this event is mostly, mainly, about Bitcoin in particular and cryptocurrencies in general, but we have to see it in a context. And the context is finance and technologies. So with this in mind, we'll see some stuff probably that we haven't heard before. When we talk about FinTech, what it comes into our minds are blockchain, payments, exchanges, research, online banking, investment, and crowdfunding. But does it really have to do directly and also only about that? Let's see. That's why I renamed my presentation the Untold History of Fiat Money because we'll talk some stuff we haven't heard. We know it existed, but we haven't heard it constantly like we study cryptocurrencies and their recent history. I'll prepare my presentation in those dots over there. The idea of the value of money, then the technologies. Then we have some histories about money and technology. Then we have the technological part and then, and how it's not technological, but cultural. And then another stories or history of recent money, of recent times. I always, it comes to my mind that's that picture. Even though it was painted in the 17th century in, well, in English it's called the moneylender and his wife, but in Spanish is el cambista y su mujer, the exchange and his wife. And it's not more, not, not different than what we do here with cryptocurrencies. Someone has the technology, we see the technology over there, which is the scale, the scale was the technology in that time and the knowledge of different kind of uh, coins. Let's talk about the idea of the value of the money, the intrinsic value of the money. The paper doesn't worth anything at all. But what happens that we give some importance to this piece of paper instead of what is referred to and supported that at this moment we have to say nothing supports that paper over there, only the trust. We heard many of times how the coins were made probably with gold and silver and it has intrinsic value, but not then the paper because you can put any, any name of the, of the currency, but you can have one unit, two hundred, seven thousand millions of units of that in that paper. And does it worth? Is it has any value of that? Let's move on a little bit. What is fiat money? Is it the same that fiduciary money? Fiduciary, fides, faith is what relies on the money. But fiat is equals to faith? Not necessarily. Have you heard fiat looks? Let there be light. Well, the beginnings of the universe. Well, let there be light and there was light. Let there be money and there is money. So it is created money. Who created? States. And then you believe and trust the state, even though you put you trust in God. But it's the idea of that you have to trust because we'll see. But not always was like that. 
take a little bit and some details of that. That was a silver certificate that was equal a dollar in silver. So that means that long time before, well, not long time before, but it used to represent that note, the amount of silver or gold that was in the bank, that was in a vault. But there was some moment, a specific moment that wasn't like that anymore. And when that began, well, have you heard about Marco Polo? Well, Marco Polo from Venice, he traveled for to today's China and he met this Heng His Khan, Kublai Khan, I'm sorry, Kublai Khan. And he realized that he was receiving the gold from all the people around China. Remember that he was from Mongolia and then he invaded China and he issued some papers worth some value. And he says, well, I have this paper and you can trade with that. If you need to pay some shipment, you pay with it. And of course the people could ask, well, and how do we do to the others to accept that paper? Well, if they don't, I kill them. And what happens if someone forfeited that note? Well, if they forfeit the note, we kill them. So that was imposed. That was by the power. And that was regularly the same. That means that paper has some value, some equivalent value in some vaults, in gold, in silver, but mostly gold. Until Richard Nixon. What happened with Richard Nixon? Well, <clears throat> Since Marco Polo, until the decades of the 70s, all the banks, all the issuer of money that could be banks, but also could be the states, they have their reserve and they have it, as I mentioned it, in gold. We'll see one picture that will talk about the Bank of England. What happens in the United States during the 70s? Well, during the Nixon administration, they said, well, I won't keep the money gold and the value of money will be the one that trades itself i mean free market of the value of their own money and of course that had effects on europe and it had effect on the, the whole world because from then on you didn't have to have that amount of gold in your vaults in your reserve so the money was issued with the trust that someone will pay it. Of course, it wasn't like Kublai Khan, but someone had to pay. And from that moment and from that idea, all the central banks work the same. They receive or they, 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 they have the control of the issuance of the money and they deliver the papers, the money. First, the papers. Let's talk first about the papers. We have to be clear in some thoughts before moving forward that there is not, there will not be any progress in humanity, in society without the banks. It's an automatic utopia. It's utopic to think that the banks will disappear, but also it's utopic that the cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin doesn't exist. Of course it exists. And it's another reality the bills and coins, the material money only exist in less than 5% of the money existed on digital. So that's another thing, another fact that we have to keep in mind. But who creates the money? First, it was printing, printing the notes. You printed the note. And then, and now, you just have a note, an accounting note. You have two zeros here. Let's put five zeros here or let's uh, provide more money to the economy. Let's put some zeros in here and press enter. More or less it's like that. And that's with what reason? Well, public debt. And that's how the states finance themselves. Because even though you have taxes, the taxes, they collect the money that the same state created. So it is a circle. To understand this better, after we talk about technologies, we'll see some interesting stories. Let's talk about technologies. We are in the era of big data, artificial intelligence, 5G, 
intelligence of things, internet of things, cloud computer and stuff. And we have heard many times about the first industrial revolution, the second, the third, what about the fourth? Well, to be a fourth, of course, there had to be a first, a second, and a third. But it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that before that, it didn't have technology. And the technologies, such things as new technology, is the technology of the moment. Because at that time, when you created the, 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 the melting pots for the, for the gold, that was the technology of the time. And what about the press? It helped it, or the facts. Always we had new technology. So the new technology of today, in a couple, not even months, probably weeks, it will be obsolete because of the moving of technology. And to understand this better and how technology, it was used before the creation of money, but the creation of money didn't depend on technology. I'll have four examples that we have to take care and take some, some attention to see how things haven't changed or not. The first one, what relationship exist with, with banking and uh, nodes and uh, law and cryptocurrencies with the Templars or Jack de Molay or the Pope Clement V or the King of France, Philip IV. Well, the thing is that the Templars were accused that, well, they had some money and they lent it to Philip and Clement and they didn't want to pay. So we know what happens with the Templars. And you'll ask, well, what have to do this with, with FinTech? We'll see. The second example is Edward IV of England and the Medici Bank. They, uh, pay attention to this. What was the Medici Bank? Well, 14th century, 15th century, Renaissance, they created the banking system of the moment. That was a banking system necessary to promote and to go to the new lands in America and all the merchants and they have well fights with with the Geneva and stuff Genoa and they lended some money to Edward and Edward didn't pay it because they have in political stuff some fights the war of the roses the Lancasters and the Tudors again what has to do with this with fintech and money and bitcoin the, another, the other example is Bank of England and William III. Well, the King William III, he needed some money for what? To continue and to make war against Louis XIV in France. And he needed that money. And what happens? Well, they created the Bank of England, the mother of all central banks. And like they did in China with Kublai Khan, he received the money and issued those million, 1.2 million pounds by the time. Didn't have it exactly in the vault. He created it, Bank of England created it under the promise that, well, the king will pay and they had that promise from the king. Not much different than we have today. What's the difference with that? Well, and then we have another example. Second World War, Germany wasn't exactly Germany, it was Weimar Republic, Republic of Weimar. And they have this coin that was called the Reichsmark. And they issued and delivered any kind of, no, any number of Reichsmark. Of course, it didn't have any value. Ended up the war. And what happens? Well, they had to recover the, the economy in, in Germany. And what happened? Well, with freedom. As long as you have freedom in the free market and the people can liberally trade with, with each other, the money has its own value and you believe in it. What have to do all this with the idea of Bitcoin? Well, as we will see, what we see there, there are agents of power states, kings, wards, who creates the money needed for creating a um, continuing war to invade different than Bitcoin that was created by another agent, not the states, not the banks. It's not that the banks or the states are bad per se, but there is another 
gamer. There's another player here. The other point that I wanted to talk is, it's not a matter of technology, it's culture. Nowadays, we'll see lines like that, even though the technology exists. So technology helps to reduce those situations, especially now that we have the COVID-19. And we'll see that all the agents, like I mentioned it before, they were political, they were ideological, they were military. So they issued the money, they used the money to promote what? Invasions, to promote uh, wars, to promote um, the, the states against the, the church and the, uh, and the religion and stuff. But who suffers? those tensions among those agents. And who's missing from that part of the stories? We mentioned it, some popes, we mentioned it, some kings, we mentioned it, some states, some words, us, the civil society, the digital global civil society. And what happens with the fourth revolution? We know that there is a first, a second, and a third. Well, the fourth revolution is the revolution about digitalization, cybernetics, internet, decentralized networks, what a big thing is, cloud computer, artificial intelligence, and cognitive computing that allow us phenomena like this, like Uber, like Airbnb, impact economy, collaborative economy, so some elements of this fourth revolution related with fiat money is transparency, security, certainty, predictability, economy, scalability, ability, immediacy, global and universal. It doesn't belong only to one state, one country. It is worldwide. Accountability, participation and representation, the importance of user experience and citizen experience, and of course, decentralization. That lead us to what? Phenomenon again, like FinTech, microfinance, crowdfunding, what is called right now, venture funds on digital era, challenger banks, neo banking. Of course, we have this, some of, some of us could see the anti-money laundering and know your client and right now they ignore your transaction like a ghost, but it can be, it can be treated with total transparency. So we'll see there is a cultural issue more than technological issue. And now let's talk about five cases, five stories, recent stories about even for crowdfunding, until bike rides. And what has to do with this? First one that I want to refer, famous, Uphold. Uphold is a financing platform, finance platform, that allows borderless, of course it has some regulations, it's not like, like Bitcoin, but the importance here is that you have a reserve status and you can check it more than the entire monies or assets uh, deposited. 100.1% of reserve. It is trustable and transparent, safe and protected. And not only that, you only have fiat money, fiat, fiduciary, let's call it estate money. You also have cryptocurrencies and then you have stocks. Of course you have cryptocurrencies and tokens, various tokens. There are very small over there, but you can check all the stocks and all the currencies they, they, they have. Second example, Bnext. Bnext is a neo bank created in Spain. The important here is the idea that you are not dealing with a regular bank, so you don't need the same licenses because you have 100% of the assets freely 
uh, on disposition of their owners. That's important here. So you can have less commissions and you can have more direct trading with people. Here you can see also transparency that they have more than 400,000 clients and they have also the possibility of using debit cards. That case or both cases mentioned here are Monzo, I don't know how many of you have heard about it, and Crowdcube. What is Monzo? Monzo is a challenger bank. So it's not like a, a neo bank that it doesn't have any license. It needs some licensing. But the idea of Crowdcube is how it was created. We will see that Monzo have the same capabilities of security and transparency and also the cards. But this was important here is that they call up the investors, and they raised 100 million pounds only in 96 seconds. That was impossible if we're not by technology. And technology, like the one behind Crowdcube, another idea, another culture of investment, only possible because of the existence of technology. And cryptocurrencies can help to create this new culture. See that, fueling the next generation of business. It is changing a mindset of how we see money and how do we see businesses. And see that there is a guy over there with a bike, with a helmet. And uh, it's interesting because that takes us to the next case, Superstrata and Indiegogo. Right now, with this situation in, in Venezuela about the, the, the gas and all that, um, well, I was forced to use, again, my bike. So I took my bike, so I connect myself with, when I was young, riding bike all over. And I saw this project, great. That bicycle was, is printed on 3D. And they needed some money to continue the project. And they went to Indiegogo, and they needed hundred thousand dollars and the thing is that using Indiegogo that these platforms are the new way of seeing businesses and investment they raised in couple days couple million dollars that was impossible without these technologies and well let's concentrate to this situation and this example remember that we talk about Medici Bank and remember that we talked during Renaissance? Well, it turns to be that there is a new Medici bank, a new Medici bank that it says a FinTech and a one and a bank in one. Banking has a service. This is, and this was un, impossible to think about it previously, the existence of this technology that what we're doing right now. I'm in Caracas, you're in, in Brazil, and a lot of people can see us from other places, and only because of this technology we can do it. And the money has to be, and the businesses in general, has to transform into these new ways of exchanging values and businesses. Important to mention, a digital only philosophy, future forward thinking, it will be interesting. I don't, I don't have any knowledge of, uh, forward or, or more than this. I would like to see how these projects uh, uh, evolves. I would like to, to follow the, 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 the metrics. And interesting here, one of the founders is descendant of the Medici family from Italy, from now Italy, then that was Florence. So it will be interesting to know about this. In conclusion, it's not only about technology. It's not only about the states and banks. It's about civil society. We created the money. We created the business. We created the technology. We all together, technologists, lawyers, economists, politicians too, and we have to have to change our mindset 
to this new way of doing business, this new way of investing, this new way of living, because we form, we conform, we are part of what is called global civil society. And also we have to remember that we are now global citizens. So we have the idea of global citizenship. Like who? Like my son, he's only two years old. But right now he's living in a world that when he uses a phone, he will be able to have their own enterprise and he can work from home. So our life is changing. And even though it's good to study all the new technology and what's happening right now, we have to see what happens before to have a more broader idea of how our culture will be better every day. I have no more words to say. Obrigado. And I hope this will help you to think some things probably different and probably to fix some ideas that you have previously. Thanks.